99, proceeded, 3, 2, 1, ignition. Right away, Houston. Bets are good. Ag thought. Good over. over. I do, you have good trust. Okay, 30 seconds. 308, your number. Take coming through 1,500 feet, and eight shot looks good. On the descent stage of Challenger, forever on the moon, they left a plaque reading, Here man completed his first explorations of the moon. December 1972 A.D. May the spirit of peace in which we came be reflected in the lives of all mankind. One revolution later, Cernan and Schmidt caught up with Evans and prepared for docking. Good to see you. Good to have you all back up here. It's been a good trip. Yeah, that Challenger is a beautiful vehicle. You bet you. December 16th. Burn out of lunar orbit and head home to Earth. Sir, Houston, America has found some fair winds and following seas, and we're on our way home. <laughs> hey, this is great. Talk, talk about being a spaceman. This is it. December 17th, 170,000 miles from Earth. Ron Evans left the command module. Hello, Mom. <laughs> what do you see, Ron? Looking great. Okay. Hey, John, how you doing? Hi, Jamie. Evans was retrieving film canisters from the two cameras and the lunar sounding radar. Data vital to the scientists on Earth. And the left was there. Before he got back inside, Evans took a last look at the Crescent Earth. In two more days, they would be home. The module, together with its uh, power unit and main engine, which is, sits underneath it down there, is what's generally referred to as the mother spacecraft. And on this flight, it will be the base of operations from which the lunar module goes down to the surface of the moon and back up. It's really quite small. At its widest point across the base, it's only about 13 feet. It's uh, made of honeycomb aluminium and steel on the outside. And the top comes off, as it is here, in order to let the crew go up through into the lunar module. There are two windows on either side through which they take most of the camera shots and then two rendezvous windows here and here with the glass slanted this way so that the crew can see through in the direction in which they're generally going, forwards, that way. The uh, hatchway here is opened only twice, once to get in on the launch pad at Cape Kennedy and once more to get out in the Pacific when they get back. Inside, it's even more cramped than it looks from outside for three men, all of whom are about five foot eleven each. The lunar module pilot, Buzz Aldrin, lies in that couch there. In the center couch, which has been taken out to let us get in, Michael Collins, the command module pilot, and Neil Armstrong, the man who will be the first to set foot on the moon, the commander, flies in the left-hand couch here. This is where the navigator, that's the command module pilot, spends most of his time, in the navigation bay. He has, of course, up there on his panel, also instruments that he has to check all the way through the flight, basically instruments that tell him the fuel states of the engines on board. This is the only part of the spacecraft that you can actually stand up in, because it leads to the docking tunnel through to the lunar module. And being able to stand up in a spacecraft really pleases most astronauts.
Good evening. When the first American astronaut steps out onto the surface of the moon, this is what he'll be wearing. It's called an extravehicular mobility unit, better known as a space suit. And the people who built it call it the astronaut's own personal spacecraft, since it has incorporated in it all the systems the spacecraft does to keep the astronaut alive and, above all, protected from the totally alien environment all around it. And it's tremendously complicated and cumbersome, obviously because it's not meant to be worn walking around in the full gravity of Earth. It takes the astronauts, after some years of practice, only five minutes to put it on and take it off. It takes me a lot longer than that without help. So to show you how it's made up, I'm going to get some help to, as it were, do a space undress. First off are the extravehicular gloves, the gloves that are worn when the astronaut's outside the spacecraft. They unlock from a metallic ring on the sleeve and are covered with layers of insulating material. Each glove is tailored to fit each astronaut's individual hand. On his back, the emergency oxygen supply and backpack. Now that's what keeps him alive when he's out on the lunar surface or doing some extravehicular activity in space, walking between the two spacecraft. That, for example, is necessary possibly during an emergency. That has enough systems on board to keep him alive, warm, and relatively happy for four hours. On his head, there are three basic sets of visors. The first one, going down now, is the visor that protects against meteorite impacts. And the second one, going down now, gold-covered, protects against glare. And they are fitted on to a kind of over-helmet, which comes straight off, revealing underneath the basic plastic pressure helmet. This is the seal that keeps the astronaut alive when he's inside the suit, and the seal is undone simply by unscrewing the pressure helmet from, and with a little difficulty in my case, from the top of the neck of the suit. Underneath the basic pressure helmet, the communications helmet with small microphones and earpieces in order to communicate with either the spacecraft or via the spacecraft mission control at Houston back on Earth. Now you'll see just how difficult it is for those astronauts to get the garment off in space. And if you can do that in a spacecraft, then you've got good reason to go to the moon.